The following is part of Cornell Contemporary China Initiative Lecture Series under the Cornell East Asia Program. The arguments and viewpoints of this talk belong solely to the speaker. We hope you enjoy. Uh, so today I'll be discussing my research on the wild fungi economy in Yunnan province. What I will focus on today will touch on my curiosity about how rural people in China and elsewhere often center their lives around a handful of key species, often plants and animals. Humans, in turn then, assemble their lives in relationship to the unique material, temporal, and biological qualities of these plants and animals. And in my case, of course, I'm interested in something neither plant nor animal, but a wild mushroom. Let me just talk a little bit about the more than human idea. So, much scholarship in China and elsewhere, whether historical or anthropological, has been anthropocentric, focusing almost exclusively on human actions. In most accounts, the living, living web of life, of animals, plants, fungi, bacteria, and more, is reduced to a mere background. In the words of the German philosopher Heidegger, most scholars take an enlightenment-oriented view of the, quote, natural world as a standing reserve the idea of seeing these beings as natural resources for human exploitation. An alternative perspective can explore how the specific behaviors and actions of different organisms shapes the world, in addition to human intentionality, but not always totally determined by that. My research has been influenced by some of these studies in this new mode of scholarship, including what some would call animal studies, or the more than human, beyond the human, or in my own field of anthropology, what's often called multi-species ethnography. So let me just um, bring up a few books in this vein. So in 2004, Virginia Anderson published her book there called Creatures of Empire, How Domestic Animals Transformed Early America. So in her book, she shows how cattle, pigs, and goats play an important and complicated role in shaping how colonialism played out especially in shaping colonial relations with indigenous people. Likewise, Richard White has written a fascinating account of settler history in the American West that foregrounds the critical role of animals, such as horses, donkeys, and cattle, in these encounters. And I would love to see more accounts like this written for places in China and other places in Asia. Within the last few decades, there have even been popular work, works, such as this book by Michael Pollan, called The Omnivore's Dilemma, which introduces an audience to the idea that humans do not hold a total monopoly on agency, that other beings may have their own forms of agency. And Poland writes about plants such as corn and how they're getting humans to do their bidding in spreading around the world. Corn is now so entangled with human care that it cannot disperse its own seeds anymore. It, makes, it needs people to remove them from the cob. Unlike horses, pigs, or dogs, modern-day corn has lost its ability to live beyond human care, to go feral. So what I will do today is to briefly bring you into two cultural realms in Yunnan province in southwest China to see how some Yi and Tibetan communities are each engaging with this one wild mushroom and how they are building their lives in relationship. So here's a picture of a young specimen. This is one of, an interesting one. It's a kind of twin one. You can see how it's like a Siamese twin there. So here in Ithaca, or maybe in New York City, maybe some of you have seen this mushroom at some of the high-end restaurants. In Japanese, it's named Matsutake, means pine mushroom. In Mandarin, it is often called songrong. Song refers to pine, and rong refers to this kind of velvety texture, like. Uh, the way that deer oh, on their antlers are in velvet have this kind of, also this velvety uh, quality. In Tibetan, however, it is known as bo sha, or the oak mushroom. So you can imagine that in southwest China, this mushroom is variable. It can form relationships with both oaks and pine. And this variation, I'll point out, is an example of Matsutake's own liveliness. And, and liveliness is one of the ways that I've been trying to get into this kind of question of the more than human or something like agency. Jack and I were talking earlier and we were saying about how there's often been this term in the academic world to go to the material, but sometimes the material is still thinking of other 
deems as basically in the, the having certain, they do have certain material properties, but I'm interested in their biological kind of liveliness. And you can also think too that the Matsutake has spread itself around the world. It was not transported like corn in ancient times. And in spreading around the world, it learned how to forge different relationships, these symbiotic relationships of exchange with different tree species as it traveled into new landscapes. That's another way to imagine this, um, this mushroom and its meaning. So I just want to offer three quick caveats about my talk. So first, I'm not a specialist in Tibetan or E culture. And here at Cornell, I see that you'll soon have someone who is, Emily Yang will be coming uh, next month, who has spent her entire career um, working with uh, Tibetans. And many anthropologists working in China with so-called ethnic minority groups specialize in just one group. But in my own work, I don't follow that model. I'm more kind of topic driven around this larger set of questions. And I'll go to different places. So when I was looking at the politics of international environmentalism, I spent a long time with Gino people and with Nashi people. Um, so in this new project, I'm focused on how different groups engage with the Matsutake as part of the global Matsutake trade, which is going to Japan. My second caveat is that although I am discussing how this wild mushroom trade is affecting social life, I am not making a kind of deterministic assertion that there are any inherent set of ramifications that emerge from a Matsutake economy or a mushroom economy. And so for those of you that know the older studies in China, in China history, I'm not doing a kind of Carl Witt-Fogel-esque idea of a la oriental despotism. And for those of you that have read uh, Timothy Mitchell's really fascinating books on, or new book on this kind of question of relationship between the qualities of petroleum and politics, I'm not quite sure how, to, how far to push that argument when it comes to, to the but what I'm showing is how a few of the particular biological bases of this specific Matsutake economy at this particular moment are having unintended and yet reverberating political and social effects. So let me just name a few of these at the onset. It has provided a source of dispersed wealth generation, which is likely far more dispersed and equitable than what the tourist economy can provide. It has helped precipitate a reverse diaspora of Tibetans from India to Yunnan and fostered the Yunnanese Tibetans' connections with other Tibetan communities outside of the province. For Tibetans in Yi, this wealth has been linked in particular to forms of ethnic revitalization, such as the creation of mushroom finance architecture in Tibetan areas and the proliferation of cultural festivals in Yi areas. In a more subtle way, the influx of cash from the Matsutake economy has led to changes in the relative local ethnic hierarchy as the wealth means that in different ways, we and Tibetans are gaining in social position, especially in terms of the Han, who have become over the last few decades the dominant group in terms of local power and wealth. Matsutake wealth has not in any way turned these ethnic hierarchies upside down, but it has rejigged some relations that would not have been predicted necessarily. So mainly, these kinds of shifts are felt at a really local level that are mainly happening for the few villages that live close to the highly productive patches of forest that, in which Matsutake proliferate. Yet nonetheless, these are important for these same people. And they provide an interesting example of how local economies may be having all sorts of social effects that might be lost when our sense of scale of analysis is at the level of the nation state or province. And my last caveat is to say that it would be a mistake, however, to argue an extreme position, place all the agency on the back of this one mushroom. For sure, the mushrooms are not calling all the shots. <laughs> Yet their occurrence and the fact that they are highly desired in Japan is shaping the way that major policy changes from Beijing roll out in China, such as the logging ban, which I will describe shortly. Indeed, by looking at the logging ban and the related campaigns to plant trees and grasslands, we can see how particular plant, animal, and fungal species carry out their lives in relationship to each other. And this has shaped the kinds of multi-species social consequences of these policies. I will go into more detail um, shortly, but now I'll just mention that the particular biology of yaks and their relationship to grass and trees 
means that for the E, uh, or for the Tibetans who are herding the yaks, a logging ban had different kinds of impacts than for the neighboring E people who are much more dependent on goats that are much more able to uh, eat a, much, a broader range of food. So briefly, let me set the larger social context for today's talk. Uh, for the past decade, I've been part of a collective team of anthropologists who travel around the world to study the global commodity chain of this mushroom. And here's a slide uh, showing everyone who's been working together. Uh, we have all worked together over the years, and then it turns out that three main, the three main people um, that have been doing a lot of joint field work together in Japan and China have been myself, Shiho Satsuka, and Anna Singh. Um, as you probably know, uh, Anna Singh has worked all over the world, but primarily in Oregon, also a bit in Scandinavia, and as well with us in Japan and China. And Shiho Satsuka has been working mainly in uh, Japan, but has also come then when I've been leading some trips in China. And so for the three of us, we're each writing one volume of a kind of rare breed of books, an academic trilogy that is based on collaborative methods. So Anna Sang has written the first book, which I'm sure a lot of you have either read or heard of, which is called The Mushroom at the End of the World, on the possibility of life in capitalist ruins. And this book is mainly focused on how to think differently about capitalism and how we might shift our ways of understanding the world from theories that we inherited, that were born during a faith in the idea of continual progress, and then asking, what does it mean to live in this era of post-progress? How do we think then today? So I'm writing the second book uh, in the series. And in terms of my own book, the first half of the book will explore how uh, Matsutake, as well as all other uh, fungi within the larger kingdom, are shaping the world around us, both in terms of deep evolutionary time and in terms of the specific relationship they form with insects and trees. So in many places, the forests are almost totally dependent on this invisible underground mycorrhizal relationship. And when you look out around, you know, from the hill today, you should also remember that 90 to 95 percent of all the plants that you're seeing are really invigorated or sometimes even made possible by underground mycorrhizal relations of these. So fungi are actively foraging for nutrients, they're actively finding water, and they are feeding these to the plants. Um, and that of a given plant, I've often read that about one third of all of its leaves, all of its photosynthesis, is actually done to feed the fungi. Uh, so there's a lot kind of going back and forth, but this has been, the Western world has been really slow to kind of recognize and see these kind of amazing underground kingdoms of a very different form of life that really keep our own life possible. So uh, the second half of my book will be mainly about this material, this research with Tibetan and E that I'll draw on for today. Okay. So now let's go ahead and travel to southwest China. So here's a map showing China. Some people say it looks like a little miniature, uh, or sorry, Yunnan province looks like a miniature China. There's Beijing to give you a sense of uh, how far away it is. And one of the things that's really interesting about this place and why it's one of my favorite places is that in this elevational map, you can see that way up there, there's all that purple area up in the northwest, and that's so averaging above 4,000 meters and sometimes above 5,000. So this is part of these massive ice fields that are right on the edge there. So some people call that the third pole. These are glaciers that have stayed since the last major glaciation. But one thing with Yunnan is that it kind of keeps going down in elevation down to here. So here, where I did uh, research back in the year 2000, 2001, there's tropical rainforests and there are herds of wild elephants there. So it's just this incredibly diverse size. To give you a sense of, of, of the relative size of this, it's in terms of New York, it is about three times the size of the state of New York, and it has about twice the population. So actually, Yunnan has a lower population density than, uh, than New York State. The capital of, of Yunnan right there is Kunming, and that has a population of about six million people. 
So it's another one of these kind of relatively small by Chinese standard cities that's rarely heard about outside of China. So as many of you know, within China, Yunnan province is considered poor. And this poverty means that Matsutake wealth can more easily play a powerful role in increasing family income than in places where people have a higher income. In Northwest China, or Northwest Yunnan up there, there are a number of rural places where individual incomes are quite low. In the mid-1990s, for instance, one of the poverty lines was set at 300 yuan per person per year, it's around 40 US dollars. So Yunnan has become the center of China's Matsutake harvest, and China has become the center of the world's Matsutake harvest. So let's just see this, this graph. This is from Japan. These are imports from, from 2005. So you can see even then, China represented 57% of all the imports into Japan. And here's uh, North Korea, which was 27. So it had a really strong showing of North Korean Matsutake. But then later they got into a trade war and that was totally shut off. So then that really even boosted China to be much more. You can see uh, America and Canada and South Korea up there. And then others just played just a really small amount. So China has really become this major, major player in what is an economy that can be worth sometimes three or four billion dollars a year. And one of the things that's really interesting about it in Yunnan is that Remember that just in the early 1980s, it was basically nothing. It has gone from something virtually non-existent to this huge uh, phenomenon uh, that's there. So some experts estimate that in Yunnan, there are more than half a million people who, when the, during the season, they rush to the forest early in the morning and the markets. It's described often as the most important agricultural crop, but really, um, strictly speaking, it's not agricultural because it's not deliberately farmed by people. Jack and I were talking earlier and saying about how it's produced or grown or uh, all these ways of writing about it as though it is cultivated like a crop, but that's simply not true. During um, my time with Japanese scientists, they were talking about how they've spent so many millions of dollars trying to cultivate Matsutake. They have these labs with some of the best scientists, best equipment, and every, almost every year there's a newspaper headline saying Matsutake finally domesticated, and then like a few weeks later another article comes and say, no, didn't work. So they, they've been trying so hard, but it's never happened. And then I kind of love how Matsutake has refused this uh, human desire. So there are all these other mushrooms that you know that have been domesticated, but all of those others are eaters of dead matter. Things like oyster mushrooms or shiitake. And they have a much less complex relationship than the uh, matsutake, which, and this is the term, it's called mycorrhizal, where they have this relationship with a tree, where, as I mentioned, the fungi have these uh, mycelia that extend underground and cover far vaster terrain uh, than plant roots ever could. They're, they're much finer, they're nuanced. Uh, mushrooms are the kind of alchemists of the world. They produce these amazing chemicals that can drill into uh, rocks and extract nutrients and, and give them to the trees and the other um, plants. And so they have these really complex relationships that have never been duplicated uh, in the lab. So let's just look a little bit at where the Matsutake are growing in Yunnan. It's basically only this, this area. So there's just limited area. As much as people would love to have it be elsewhere, it's, again, one of the ways in which it's the biological qualities of what Ma the places that Matsutake is willing to live. And then even within these areas, it only grows in very patchy ways. So it can be abundant on one hill. You look across the valley, and there's none on the other. So many of these qualities of its liveliness remain a mystery for scientists. And they would love to be able to cultivate it, and they, or they would love to be able to predict where it will grow, even when they will emerge, and if the season will be abundant or scarce. But so far, to make these predictions has been a really elusive science. So this, 
mention several other aspects of its liveliness that affect the way that the trade is organized. First, it's best fresh. When dried or frozen, its flesh changes in quality that are not as desirable for Japanese consumers. As the matsutake decays quickly, it must be rushed to market, usually from forest to plate, within 48 hours. Second, matsutake is an object of desire not just for people, but for insects that are all around it. And almost every time, they will be human to a matsutake. So then when you pick it, there are almost always small larvae growing within it. And their presence can then turn what is a fine mushroom into a pile of mush in a few days. And so the dealers and pickers are rushing these markets quickly to Japan. And the interesting thing is I never really understood what refrigeration was used for different ways, like keeping it fresh. But it was explained to me that the cold slows down the insects' movement. It slows down their eating as the insects are eating within, within the mushroom itself. So that's part of what's, what's going on. But as you know, if any of you have gone out to find other wild mushrooms, they're not all the same. There's a beautiful orange, yellow uh, mushroom called a chanterelle that probably grows around here, I would assume. And those are rarely eaten by insects, and their flesh is more solid. So those kind of commodity chains end up working in a really different way because of the quality between the relation between insects and fungi. And then almost all of the other mushrooms in this area are dried. And here's a picture of some of the trade in these dried mushrooms. And one of the interesting things is that the drying will kill any insects that are within it. And the, the people sometimes in the villages will just have a room just full of these bags of dried mushrooms. And if they seal it right, if the, the bags are thick enough, if they tightened it well enough, and if these particularly tenacious bugs aren't in the area <laughs> that will crawl inside and eat them, then they can store it for years. They can wait for the price to rise. But the matsutake pickers, they just need to sell them every single day. No matter the price high or low, they just need to sell it and ship it out there. So it's really interesting that the drying of these other mushrooms, not matsutake, but the ones that the Italians love, the porcini, they go into a kind of commodity chain that is very, very different. But that's also because of the, the presence of insects and the relationship of insects. It was really amazing to see the quantities there. And I was told that a lot of these dried mushrooms are being shipped to Italy. I talked with one expert who said that most of the little, when you see a mixed mushroom package here in the States that says from Italy, chances are they're actually Chinese mushrooms. So they're just shipped <laughs> to Italy, packaged up in a nice, beautiful package, and then sent here. So that, those could be your nice Italian mushrooms right there. So for the second half of the talk, I just want to say a little bit about the ethnic Tibetans and E. And it's interesting, because I think that almost everybody growing up in North America, by the time they're an adult, would have heard of Tibetan people. But for the E, very few, it seems. And for some of you that might know, there are more E in the world than there are Irish in Ireland. But usually outside of Southwest China or outside of China, there are very few people that know much about um, the E. So I'm just going to say a little bit about one of the transformations that happened. And it's something, too, that Jack's done a lot of interesting research on, which was what happened. The world's largest logging ban occurred after these catastrophic floods of the Yangtze River in 1998, which some people claim affected 300 million people. It's a little bit up for, for doubt. But um, there were kind of two policies there, this grain to green plan and then the National Forest Conversion Program. And basically, it meant this huge uh, ban on logging that really affected the upper watershed of the Yangtze. So you can see here in green, there's the Yangtze River. And this is the famous kind of bend. And this is the kind of heartland of, of Matsutake. And there was a lot of uh, pressure there to, to enforce these policies um, quite strongly. And so one of the things it did is up in the Tibetan areas, there was a really lucrative logging industry because there were some, in part, some old growth forests that were only recently logged or were still even there. Whereas for the E areas, which are further south around in here, a little bit farther from the river, 
Uh, those areas had mostly been logged out of the old growth some time ago. So what happened was that up in the Tibetan area, some of these towns had nearly 80% of their revenues from logging. So when the ban comes in, it just overnight forces these villagers and the town planners to scramble to find alternative sources of money. And in some areas, Matsutake become, became that kind of alternative force that kind of went from, from logging to Matsutake. Uh, tourism gained in importance, but then there were many fewer places in which to kind of set up this tourist infrastructure. So secondly, the ban also promoted growing trees in grasslands and protecting them from animals. So it meant more of a crackdown on the kind of control burns that Tibetans had used to kind of keep their grasslands from uh, trees encroaching into them. And in order to promote forest regrowth, uh, which hemmed in the possibilities for grazing yaks, which like to eat the grasses and orbs, um, they started to kind of set up areas to uh, plant these seedlings, often on some of the richest uh, lands that had the water, that had the springs, the soil, and kind of fenced these off as places to grow trees, but they had been the, the key critical places to um, be grazing yaks. Okay, so let's just think about a few of the stories that have been told around the Tibetans and the Matsutake. So one of these is by this world famous mycologist, um, David Aurora, and Jack and I were talking about him earlier this morning. He celebrates mushroom hunting, and he's gone all around the world to see how different cultures incorporate mushrooms into their lives. And when he got to Yunnan, he was thrilled because he saw mushrooms being incredibly important there, specifically the Matsutake. And he said that those villages that have gone into uh, that business have been far more successful than went into the tourist business. So he coined this term the Matsutake mansions, and people are just building these huge structures. They're really monumental and almost totally just from the proceeds of this one mushroom. And they're much bigger than the previous homes. Another story that you'll hear um, for this area is by uh, Emily Ye, who will be here next month. And she's almost emphasizing the opposite that in many ways the Matsutake trade has brought in new forms of conflict. And her study is especially interested in the places where there's a Matsutake rich area, village, and a, one that's Matsutake poor, and how they've kind of been in these long-term simmering disputes about land rights. And for those of you that have worked in China know that a lot of times the village lands were, were kind of scooped up within the commune system. And so there's kind of histories of who owns what hills um, that hasn't just been a kind of traditionally held and accepted land tenure policy. That actually kind of all got thrown up into the, you know, up in the air during the 50s and 60s, and now they're kind of working it out. So I think that both of them are somewhat correct, but there's also more to the story. So for, to temper Aurora's version of the events, we should also remember that there are those Tibetan mushroom hunters that have sold off their yaks. <clears throat> and they have often been tied to these yaks for sometimes even thousands of years. So that has made them much more vulnerable to these incredibly rapid fluctuations in the value of Matsutake. So they can even rise and fall within a single day or you know, over a season from year to year. And so if they're putting all of their kind of emphasis into Matsutake and compared to yaks that can provide them with a lot of basic needs of sustenance and also the milk and the butter and the cheese and the meat and, and uh, the, the fur and other things. And that really changes uh, their lives. Uh, but on the other hand, we should also temper Ye's version perhaps because this Matsutake wealth has led to all sorts of ramifications, not only conflict, and there are also many other sources of wealth Matsutake is not the only actor. I'm just going to add a few of my own observations about the trade. And one of the things that has been really interesting is to see kind of along these lines, but, um, but also there's some more subtle twists, this rejuvenating effect in, in terms of the visual displays of Tibetan cultural heritage. And this is the most visible one. 
But then when you go inside these, I'm sorry this slide's a bit dark, but what you can see in there, at least on this wall, is that the walls are full of these uh, Tibetan Buddhist paintings uh, inside. So this is the main area. There's the uh, stove and you'd be drinking you know, the yak uh, uh, butter tea that's mixed with the puar, the puar tea from southern Yunnan or from that area drinking there. And I asked them, you know, who is doing all these paintings? Where are these Tibetan artists being brought in uh, to do this? And what people in this one village said, they said, oh no, this is mostly by the rats. And I said, what do you mean by rats? And they said, oh, that's a term that we call these people from Sichuan. And they said they're being trained, the Sichuanese are being trained and spending, you know, hundreds of hours making these beautiful paintings and carving wood inside you know, dozens of these large homes. And so one of the things that was interesting to me is that it speaks to this kind of sense of change. And so this is the first time we've been able to hire people from Sichuan that kind of we've been the bosses employing them. This is a different kind of thing. Um, this is a way in which we have this, um, oops, your battery's running out. It's like a jack on a laptop. Um, you know, that has changed um, the possibilities. Do you need to take care of I'll just keep going, but maybe, okay. Um, so there's a certain pride then for some of the others that they've been able to take the money and then put it into uh, truck driving because this is part of the T horse caravan that went up and down and went in from Yunnan and went up all the way up into India. And so for some of them, taking the Matataki money, not just putting it into the home, but putting it into trucks that then can be part of this long distance truck trade. Some of them were saying, yes, we're finally now kind of reinventing, reinvigorating the caravan. Our people have done this for centuries and the money from the mushroom is allowing us to be, once again, these kind of long distance traders. And when we look at these trucks with these amazing paintings on them, they're almost all driven by men, and, and they talk about the kind of bravery that they have for um, driving on these roads. And as Jack knows and others that have been to Yunnan, they're incredibly steep, right down, you know, down to the Yangtze River. Uh, they often don't have guardrails. Thank you very much. And um, during the Matsutake season, this is actually exactly the time when the rains are coming and there are huge landslides. Just, uh, so this is really also uh, ch changing how that, how that works. And it's interesting because the effect of the trade is also changing with different generations. So there are a number of youth who pick uh, the Matsutake and they often chafe at these kinds of restrictions on their elders about what they can do. And they, some of them were telling me that Matsutake hunting provides this kind of convenient cover for courtship so that you can, you'll sometimes see parked along the road these motorcycles in the Tibetan areas. And they're often ridden by a young couple, you know, maybe in their teens or their 20s. And they'll go off and just pick mushrooms together all morning. And people say, yeah, it's, it's fine if we you know, bring home a lot. But if we come back and we don't have any mushrooms to show, people start talking. But <laughs> at least it, it gives them a really kind of fun thing to do. And you know, and I want to say too that that buying these, you know, these kind of motorcycles, these cheap motorcycles, give them all these kinds of newfound freedom and ability to move. And it used to have to be a, a horse that they would borrow, and the horse would be owned by someone else, and tie them into a certain way in which the uh, motorcycle is different. So it may seem a little bit idyllic, so let's look at a few of the challenges. So one of the challenges is, as I said, this vacillating uh, the, the price that goes really uh, up, and, up and down quite quickly. So for example, to give you a sense of this, at one point, Japanese matsutake were selling for $2,000 a pound. That was just the kind of crazy heyday of that. In some times uh, where I am in Canada, it has gone down to $2 a pound. So really, I can barely think of any commodity that has any of this, this, this kind of massive amount of volatility, certainly far more than oil, for example. Okay. 
Secondly, one of the challenges has been that while Tibetans in Yunnan have started to connect more with this larger Tibetan community, it also means that their own children were going more to Lhasa, and then um, it then later, though, made them more vulnerable through their greater affiliations with Tibetan elsewhere. So there was a rise in Tibetan activism in 2008, especially in Lhasa, and that led to a, a heavy military presence even in Yuna, which really hadn't been the case um, ever before. Okay, so now let me turn toward the E and tell you a little bit about how this is working out. So they've benefited quite a lot from the trade, at least in the towns where I've done field work. And they have often there kept Han middlemen out of the picture, not at all what happened with uh, Tibetans. So listening to conversations by the E. Laobang, the boss of the entrepreneur, I am impressed that nearly all of their conversations with others were always in one of the E languages. And sometimes, too, in town, they would receive packages, so from, from a bus or a truck. So the, the pickers up in the mountains would just give it to the truck driver, the bus driver, who would take it down to the dealer. And so there's absolutely no, no um, negotiation on the price. The dealer would just take it, uh, write down the quality and quantity. And so there's a really more intimate model of commerce among the E. And everyone seemed to know each other, at least in this one, uh, the few towns that I worked in. And so some said, too, that when other Han middlemen would come in from the city, that to, to buy the mushrooms and even offering a higher price than themselves, that no one would sell it to them. So this is what at least the, the Laobans were telling me. Um, so here's another way in which it happens sometimes. You can see that one of the dealers has bought a, um, uh, set up a big buying station down below, but he'll send up this guy in the uh, purple shirt. And so he, there's a one, box right here, and there are several others over there. So these three gentlemen had just spent the afternoon traveling pretty far to buy from a lot of smaller pickers, you know, small level pickers or other dealers. And they given, you know, shown what they had to sell, and the guy sitting in the chair with his hands behind uh, his head is basically offered the price, and these guys are gonna talk about it for a while, but really, there's, there was no real negotiation here. They basically had to take this price um, or there was nowhere to go. Uh, so here's a picture too of the kind of the buying station. That's one, that's one of the e bonds there. So for him and uh, several of his peers, one of the things that they're doing is that they're not doing this kind of uh, Matsutake mansion equivalent like the Tibetan one. They are more setting up different uh, restaurants and places for E performance. So people told me before that all the restaurants in the area just served Han food. Um, and they said, in comparison, there are these new E restaurants that have goat stew, goat milk cheese, wild vegetables, and then this homemade alcohol that some people call the E white lightning. And they are they're working together to create what they're sometimes calling an E economy. And so for him and some of the other dealers are hoping to find jobs where their own children can find work in which they can speak E, rather than before they said all of the other jobs would require them to be doing everything solely in Mandarin. So it's interesting, he said, often before the cultural festivals would be more often done at the request of government officials, and now they're doing uh, more of their own thing or people are playing music. There's also a kind of e-music revitalization that's been interesting. And it has also been changing the ethnic hierarchies um, a bit there. There are some grumblings that there are just a, these few dealers, and there's a sense that they really have an obligation to share their wealth, and people are not always um, convinced that they are doing it properly. So one of the interesting things that's happening here is this question about how land would be divided. So for those of you that might not know, in China there was often this move to take village forests and then divide them up into subplots for family lands. And But the idea of the family lands was based on the idea that those lands were valuable just for the timber, for the trees. Because the trees you could see, you know, which places had bigger trees or smaller trees, and the idea that 
Those trees will be used by the family to build another house or to sell for cash. But then after the logging ban, especially when the trees were not supposed to be cut down, this really transformed things. As well, once people started getting into the Matsutake economy, they said, ah, the, the places that used to be the good patches of, of woods with the bigger trees, they were not necessarily also the same places that were good for Matsutake. And you couldn't guard your little plot, your little family plot in the woods. So a lot of them started to actually recombine these what had been divided as family plots into these larger uh, collective plots. So it's interesting to see, too, that this Matsutake economy and its particular biological liveliness is reshaping questions of land tenure. And so it's changing, whereas before they were saying, like, yes, it's dividing up, it's privatizing, this is more what the World Bank and others are trying to advocate for, um, and that this is a desirable Another thing that they're doing sometimes is that they are using a technique that's sometimes used in Japan where the village will get together and then auction off the rights to collect Matsutake from the village forest. And so that will go to the highest bidder and then the proceeds from that will be divided uh, among people. So I found it fascinating the way that this little mushroom is engendering different ways of experimenting with land tenure, different ways of dividing up land, different times of seeing value, in part from the logging ban, but also from um, other forms as well. So they're creating new ways to manage these forest lands. So uh, I'll just show you a few of the mushroom pickers that we saw through Matsutake. Here's Hoya with one of his first Matsutake. Here's someone showing us how back in the 80s, the Matsutake used to be just kind of spiked through this little branch and sold basically for pennies to people. Back in those days, people would just eat it themselves, and they would say, it's OK, but not as good as tofu. But he said, you know, oh, he said, oh, it pains him today to think that they ruined all these beautiful Matsutake that would have been so valuable today, but they were just kids uh, selling it around. So in sum, if I talk today, I've sketched out a few aspects of how the particular biological qualities of one organism, a wild mushroom, shape the ways that people build their lives around this. And I'm referring to this as the Matsutake's liveliness. So in part, this is the quite limited range of where the Matsutake will grow. It's neat for specific kinds of pine and oak trees as mycorrhizal hosts its patchy qualities within this range, its attraction to insects and the speed of decay that all inflect the market that is built around it. And yet, true to my anthropological training, I show a few ways in which different groups do things differently, providing some details of how the Tibetan and E places that I worked in shaped the markets and what was done with this wealth was done in different in some ways, the wealth was more generally turned to uses that were connected to a, a period of overall rise in ethnic revitalization in the region. Yet specifically, we find these important differences in how the markets were organized and how people spent money. I'm not presenting this case as a kind of panacea. We can easily imagine that the value of uh, Matsutake may decline, that it may be kind of become a total bust. But nonetheless, it has already deeply shaped these kinds of land take, these kinds of social relations, uh, these kinds of ways of being. And you know, in a good day, it has continued to draw people in that are waking up early in the morning and filling their satchel with Matsutake. You have to remember that in this place, there are few alternative ways to make money. And many consider this a relatively enjoyable way to do so. Uh, we've done work all around the world, and it's interesting that no one talks about mat hunting matsutake or other mushrooms as work. It's always experienced as something different than work. And people talk about it as a, a kind of something like work, but without a boss. And what's interesting, too, in this wild kind of element to it, there's a sense of the gamble and the adventure. You never know what you'll find. So I'm hoping that the study may in turn inspire other scholars in Asia and elsewhere to look more deeply into the particular qualities of liveliness of a range of plant, animal, and fungal species that are the basis we have to keep remembering for human livelihoods, whether for sale or for subsistence. 
This is part of a move toward acknowledging how these other beings that we rely on have lives above and beyond their status as resources and commodities. I hope I provided just a bit of insight into how these dynamics are working out in contemporary China as even Tibetan mushroom pickers build new worlds for themselves as they find and sell their mushrooms to Japan. And through these daily actions, they are creating one of the most lively mushroom markets in the world. Okay, thank you.